Hello and welcome to another Market Muse content strategy webinar in our series. I'm Jeff Coyle, the co-founder and chief strategy officer for Market Muse. And today we're going to be talking about something that I love, knowledge graphs. We're also going to be getting into structured content and the role that that plays in, you know, building knowledge graphs using ontologies. Um, and we're going to get into how that may influence or is already influencing generative artificial intelligence, large language models, um, and related technologies. Um, couldn't get a better guest for this, an amazing thought leader. Um, he is a content architect at LS Media, which he's going to tell you a little bit about, Larry Swanson. Thanks for joining us, Larry. I really, really appreciate your time, um, and I'm very excited about this discussion. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, LS Media and then also your path through uh, your career, getting into content, content structures, um, and then now with uh, you know, kind of being the person that organizes conferences on knowledge graphs? Yeah, well, um, it's interesting. You see, I, I've never contextualized myself that way, way, but the way you just said that, it's like LS Media pretty much reflects my career because right. I started it in 1998. Back, I um, had been doing dot com consulting and a lot of, you know, just the usual stuff that people like us did back in the mid 90s. And uh, so I started the company just to start working with clients. And so it's sort of, so in that era, I was working mostly doing, um, like uh, the usual stuff, SEO. Uh, that's how I first got into structured content. You know, 15 years later, the knowledge Google's knowledge graph comes along, and mm -hmm. you have to start thinking about uh, schema.org and all that stuff. But um, uh, but so I did a lot of SEO, website building, just the usual. You know, one th one thing I like to say is like we didn't have CMSs back then, so I had to build my own. I, I I'm not a developer. I didn't build them, but I worked with teams of developers to build a couple of CMSs. Then got into some. Um, uh, kind of my own, some web publications I started. I've worked on probably, got half a dozen or more different web publication startups. And then got tired of being a publisher because it's the worst way in the world to make money and got into, um, uh, and, and also at the same time over that same period, that was probably like the mid to late 2000s, I guess. I started identifying more as a, as a UX designer. And then, uh, and so there's sort of been this like less and less about publishing, more and more about design, and um, and just more the human centricity and all that stuff that comes along with that. And I now identify as my title says as a content architect, where I kind of put together all that, um, you know, the, the the how to serve people best and um, how to build the systems that help us do that. Right. And, and and so I guess like what what would be the mission now? Um, so what are you seeing? What types of questions are people asking? Um, kind of modern looks at content, structured content. Um, how is that evolving in the last say year or two? And I know I, I spent some time last year with you at in New York City in, in Roosevelt Island actually at the Knowledge Graph Conference, and we were seeing you know Neptune for example, kind of trying to change the way that uh, infrastructure and that's an AWS platform. Um, you're seeing a lot of, um, you know, teams trying to build kind of roll your own knowledge graphs, roll your own ontologies. What are the things that are happening right now? Um, you know, that oh, that's right. I, are I, really I, innovative. Yeah. yeah, I forgot that you weren't there because you were there two years ago. This year, yeah. it was 100 percent. Yeah, no, it was all LLMs all the time. Mm -hmm. And I was excited about that because I was like, oh, great. These LLMs are notoriously stupid and ignorant. Maybe we can help them with these knowledge representation models. And there was some of that there. And I think there is still a lot of hope for that. But what was really interesting to me is that, you know, one of the, the things that generative AI and, and you know, chatbots and uh, LLMs have shown to be really good at is like helping folks write code. So a right. lot of the folks there, like, you know, Dean Alamang and, and, and uh, Deborah McGinnis and people like that were excited about um, or intrigued by and sometimes excited about the, the prospect of uh, LLMs helping them write OWL and SQL and, and Sparkle queries and stuff like that. So that was really interesting to me. But and I think but the the, the main take home this year was that back and forth between um, the 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 capabilities, the the, the kind of the uh, probabilistic LLMs and the kind of ontology driven uh, knowledge graphs and how they might fit together. I don't know if there's any definitive answers about that yet, but it's the the, the discussion has started. Right. So just for folks who may not be familiar, I want to give them the the Larry 101 on uh, a few things that you've said and a few things that they might not know. And then we can then you can start to see. And, and, and it's really where my brain is here is, um, you know, Google's knowledge graph, um, 
what is a you know what is a knowledge graph generally what is an ontology how are they different those are things that i think a lot of people ask me about how can i use that but let's just start with from your take um on kind of what is an ont what is an ontology and how do you think about that and then i'll follow up with uh, some other kind of larry's basics here <laughs> My, it's interesting, I, I, I was challenged recently on how I think about ontology, so I'm kind of reformulating it in my head, but I've always thought about like, you know, all the work I've done, all the I, information architecture work I've done over the last like 25 years, it's always started with, um, you know, with just cocktail napkin sketches of like what you got, like modeling the domain you're in, and uh, what are the entities that you're talking about, what are their characteristics, what are their properties and attributes and all that stuff, and then you know, I used to do that. You'd do an ER, an entity relationship diagram like that, and you'd end up sitting down with a SQL programmer and figuring out how you're going to build a database or something like that. Nowadays, right. I think about uh, you take that ERD and you formalize it into like concepts that you can organize in a way that makes the domain make sense for the project you're working on. That's something that I think is it's an interesting contrast between like schema.org and upper ontologies like that and how they try to get everything in there. But like the best, you know, when you're organizing things that way, it has to be application. Like, what are you gonna do with that? And so right. the ontologies I work with, a classic example of that, I've got, I have a friend who's working on a, a book about uh, domain modeling. And he talks in there about the domain of pets. You know, that you like a pet store owner looks at it differently from a pet owner who looks at it differently than a veterinarian. Same domain, same terrain, but you, you have different you know, just different ways of labeling things and what you care about and how you care about it and things like that. So anyhow, so the upshot of that is, and the, the way I t often talk about like an, how I end up with an ontology is I think about like you do all the domain modeling stuff that informs your ontology. And then as a content modeler and a content architect, I think about that same stuff. I'm like, great, what are you going to say about that? <laughs> that's your content. And so that's, so I I kind of have this, and this is where I was challenged recently, kind of reevaluating this. But I, I still think it makes sense to think about domain modeling leading to an ontology and um, and sort of content strategy over that domain leading to a content model. Nice. And so that, you know, that gives you an idea. And if you were a content person, if you are an SEO and you're listening to this show, you're like, okay, when are they going to get the stuff that I get, right? <laughs> An ontology, the way that it's represented is going to model effectively the information architecture of your site. It's going to model the types of ways that you think about the topics you're covering on your website, the characteristics of those things. And if you have a very strong uh, taxonomy, if you have a very strong underlying ontology and you really get the things that you care about, when you start to write, you're going to look at that. If you looked at that ontology, like, hey, that kind of looks like my topic clusters. That kind of looks like the content that I'm creating for my site. Um, and that's where the theories that apply to semantic SEO, to topic clustering come from. It's saying, if I really, really knew a lot about A, then it would be natural that I would also know a lot about B. That's why we talk to people like Larry on this show, because it's the core of why we do the things we do and what the elite SEOs know already. And so if you're thinking about this now, awesome time to do it because we're gonna get into some of the things that I've been doing with ontologies. But first, and I know that Larry's been doing with them with structured content. And I, my perspective is it gives larger teams an unfair advantage. And that's because they're gonna already have these things set up. They're not building them from scratch. So getting to the point where at least you understand the structures of your content is gonna be a critical path for you. Um, and I hopefully you have that takeaway. But first, when you said owl, I love vocabulary. I love unraveling and, and pulling back on. Okay, so I have fortunately or unfortunately <laughs> written a lot of owl uh, and you know the web ontology, let's say language. Tell 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 the, uh, the anyone listening about that and why it's critical to you know to, why it was critical to um, uh, generalize or make a universal language that everybody could understand. Yeah, well, that's funny. As, as you said that, I realized I've been proactively avoiding learning coding languages for 30 years and so far pretty successful. I mean, I, I play with the scripting languages, PHP and JavaScript and stuff like that. But I have, um, but I work more, and this is something, just a quick aside on this, it's sort of a frustration of mine in the ontology engineering world that I've been, you know, I've been hanging out in study groups and hanging out with the, you know, the people who literally, literally wrote the books on these things for the past <laughs> few years. I've been trying to tell them, like in my world, I run mostly in the product 
content world out in with the content designers at big enterprises and stuff and in that world there's a real clear distinction between research and design and content design content practices of various kinds and and engineering in that world it's just the engineers do everything they do all the discovery around the terminology and formulating the control vocabularies and term lists and stuff that get articulated in taxonomies and ontologies and stuff so anyhow so um, I think of myself more as a designer. And so in that world, I'm concerned mostly with ontology design. Um, but I do, you know, like the other thing I do know, even though I haven't learned all these programming languages, I spend a lot of time with engineers and understanding what they do and how they operate. And my last couple bosses have called me the engineering whisperer because I, I know as a content, I, I speak better to them than, or, or more, I can, I can get, have better conversations with them than many content people, I think. Um, but anyhow, back to OWL, um, so as this goes back, and I was super excited about this. I remember the day that Scientific American article came out in, I think it was 2001, Tim Berners-Lee and, and, um, and uh, Jim, um, uh, oh shoot, I'm spacing on his name, um, wrote the book about the semantic web. And th this, this goes back to that. The, the, the foundations of the semantic web were RDF, the resource description framework, that is the thing that makes all this stuff happen. And then you needed a way, one of the powerful things you can do with that is have a way to have it both human understandable and machine readable. And OWL is the thing that makes it machine readable. And it's based on description logic, which I've studied enough to know that like my brain is just like, I'm pretty smart, but I don't, and I have a fair number amount of bandwidth for learning new things, but I don't think I'm going to go all the way down that rabbit hole either. But anyhow, OWL is the way that you, you know, just as when you design a website, you formally describe it with JavaScript and HTML and stuff. When you design an ontology, you formally describe it with a tool like OWL, and then you query it with, with languages like Sparkle. Um, yep. So I'm, I'm pretty clear conceptually on it, but I, I can't, I'll never be able to speak as well as somebody like you to the details of implementing it. <laughs> but like like uh, Jim, Jim uh, Hendler, I believe. Hendler, right? Hendler. Yeah. Sorry, thanks. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, he wrote. That's a great book. Uh, that's uh, it might be under James. Um, uh, but yeah, that's a great example. So as you described it, I love the way that you think about it because it's it, it's knowing. And we had uh, Seth early on, uh, maybe a year and a half ago, and he gave his ontologies and taxonomies basics. Um, if you want to listen to that show, but. I, like, I love the pets example because you're thinking about what are the things in this ontology? Are they animals? Are these animals pets, right? Are they people? What are their relationships? This person has a pet or it's, is it owned by? Who watches, you know, what are, the in, what are the actual instances of? And what you do from that is you build out taxonomies, right? And so you're building the hierarchical classification of all the types of pets and really, what are the relationships? And, and you're building it customized for you so that you can do stuff with it right and so you can do stuff with it and there's a formal structure and so what you do with it could be build a you know uh a t something for your technical communications build something for your support build something for your marketing team um so when you do these these practical applications having that infrastructure is critical so i'll give you a little if you're a b2b SaaS company and you have two product lines and one of them is on network monitoring and the other one's on session border controllers, right? Do you naturally know how those two things associate with one another, those two concepts, right? And what is the mechanisms for them to actually get to the point where they actually overlay, right? And that's that was the basis of why we do why we want the understanding of these things. So imagine if you could imagine if you knew that, what a huge upper hand that would give you if you're an SEO. What a huge upper hand that would give you if you're a content marketer, because you could do in your brain the six degrees of separation or six degrees of Kevin Bacon, and you know exactly how to tie these things together logically. And I think that that's where you see some of the mistakes in the SEO world. Um, you see people wanting to go to tactics too quick. This morning, I even saw a how to make a topic cluster um, infographic, and it couldn't have been more you know, problematic the way that it was presented. I'm like, no, 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 that's not how you do it. But the hard part about this is how do you explain this to somebody? How do you explain ontologies and taxonomies and structured data to somebody so that it's simple? How do you explain it to them so it's approachable? And that's where I, because because I can go into there and I go, hey, no, no, that's wrong. You don't want to do this reciprocal link structure because it's unnatural and you actually want support clustering here. 
because it would be a weird jump to go from A to C here. You need a B. Like, how do you explain that to somebody who has is it's their first day? They're an awesome content person. They're an awesome, uh, you know, IA potentially even who just isn't thinking about this. How do you make it easy for them in this world? Yeah, I don't. That's the thing. I don't think you can make it easy because it is mm-hmm. complex stuff, and it's. Um, and to me, it's like, and that's been, the, as you say in that, the last three, four, three years at the Knowledge Graph Conference, I've had a multiple conversations like, hey, you got to help me explain this to my grandma or my mom or my niece or somebody. You know, I, it's like, and I'm, I'm not super successful at that, I have to admit. I like people rolls, people's eyes just roll back in their head when I start talking about this stuff. So I'm, I'm uh, you know, when I talk to my peers and colleagues, I can get into what you were just saying about like, helping content strategists and information architects get it. It's not as big a leap for them. I, I'm, I guess I've been really unsuccessful with getting civilians onboarded, but I have had more success with content designers, content strategists, um, information architects, it was especially information architects. This is like they, many of them know more about this stuff than I do, you know, and I identify as an, that's part of where my title came from. I've, I've identified right. for many years as an information architect and a, and a content person um, and, Put those together, you get a content architect, but, but, um, but yeah, it's it, so helping people get it is. I, I think a lar- a large part of it is like, well, a couple things. Like for SEOs, I think a lot of it's. Um, I think most SEOs get the idea now, even though I still hear the word keyword. You know, the people talk about keywords a lot, but it's really concepts and objects. You know, they, they, Google is more concerned with addressing user intent about getting to an entity somewhere in there. You know, they're, they're thinking about it differently, where I still hear a lot of talk about um, keywords and you know having the right keywords in an article. It's like, Google doesn't care what the keywords are. They understand the meaning of the article and can match that up. That's where the, and, and then you kind of match that up to an ontology. And that's kind of how it starts to match with an ontology too, because I, and this is the way I, I have had success talking to SEOs about this, because SEOs all understand schema.org now. And I'm like, that's just a super big ontology. You've got a smaller one. Your, your job is easier. You know, you just have to figure out how what you do can plug into the schema.org. And you need to be clear about how your stuff may differ from exactly how they do it, but how you still need to plug in, because that's how they understand it. And we're all still bowing, bowing down to Google after 20 years to, to make that happen. So yeah, so in terms of helping SEOs, but in terms of helping content strategists and information architects, I think it's more about just kind of um, advancing from, you know, not advancing from, but just sort of putting taxonomies, like for example, putting taxonomies in the context of an ontology. Like Mm -hmm. it's really interesting because you can think about it as like almost like a, you bundle up a bunch of taxonomies and organize them almost the way you would like. One of the analogies, you know, back to that analogy of, of what you do with a domain model. If you create an ERD and then create a SQL database, you create a bunch of tables and each entity has its own table and then instances of it that populate rows in that. Um, in, in an ontology, it's it's more the, the you're like if you're designing an ontology, you're more, um, it's just instead of putting it into tables, you you have like concepts, an RDF concept that itself can be organized into a taxonomy, which is pretty wild and a little mind bending. But but I help. But that's that's how I think it's coming at it from the the relationships between between taxonomy and ontology is the way it was where I've had success there because you know content people always know about controlled vocabulary. They might even call it taxonomy a lot of the time. They have term lists or controlled vocabularies or things like that. Um, but once you bundle all those up into an, a, a taxonomies and then start to connect those and show how you can derive some business intelligence out of all that. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And and one way that I've, so I like to, so you used animals. And so I use animals all the time to describe this to folks. And I, I, as, as a, as a kickoff into this for, for SEOs and it made me something you said just made me, I said, most SEOs put freshwater fish in their saltwater tank. Right. That's my analogy. Ooh, I like that. I'm yeah, stealing you like that. that one. Thank you. Yeah, you can steal it. <laughs> uh, and, and that's where the meaning of things isn't important to them. And so they're, they're, they're likely to just as likely to cover this fish over that fish because each of those fish have a different search volume and they want all the fish. But they're less likely to know when a fish is maybe going to kill the other fish if they put it in the same tank, right? And they're less likely to know whether their freshwater fish should go into the saltwater tank or not. Guess what happens if you put a freshwater fish in a saltwater tank? It's a disaster. And guess what? When Google reads your website, 
and they see that you've put a freshwater fish in the saltwater tank, you're in trouble. You just, and you'll never know why. And this is where the last 10 years of SEO has changed. If you're not exhibiting these signals that you're an expert through the structure of their content and the structure of your, the way they're related, eh, I watch people and, and, and I watch the, there's a lot of touts on the internet now. They, you know, usually they're pointing at their YouTube videos and they're like, I made this go up and to the right. It's amazing. I'm like, yeah, in about four months, that site's going to crash because they're putting, and I, you know, I've used this one. My, some of my team has probably heard it a lot before. They're probably laughing on the background uh, is, is, is cause is, yeah, you're putting a whole lot of uh, salt water fish in that freshwater tank, man. It's going to be, it's going to be a bad day for you. And, you know, over time it gets there and then you make mistake after mistake, after mistake, after mistake, because you don't have that, that structure. And I think it's a, it, some people will pigeonhole it as, um, the way that I can set up my mega menus or my menus. And that's, that's the only thing that's good for taxonomies, but there's just so much more. And so tell me a little bit about, um, and then we're going to get into LLMs because I think I want to know about the Knowledge Graph Conference and how it was. I missed it. It was I had so much stuff going on. I, I I was like cringing, and my friend who lives in New York was like, "Aren't you here?" And because he thought like he was just going to like happen to run into me that week, and I'm like, "Oh man, now I've got two reasons to be FOMO." Um, uh, Knowledge Graph FOMO though. That's that's a fun concept. Um, but think, tell me about structured content and why you know why that matters generally and then how it would apply to somebody who's thinking about the marketability of the website yeah well i think in this modern world where we're you know just if you want to be ready for omnichannel content delivery for personalization or even just recommendation engines any of that stuff i don't know how you handcraft that you don't have marketers building landing pages to address any of those right. three needs um the so and so that means at least rudimentary structuring of your content, like sorting it out, you know, somewhere between what WordPress does and and all the way down to like a really pedantic data structure. There's all kinds of ways in between that to structure your content for for all the traditional reasons that you just that you structure content, you know, for addressing those specific needs I just mentioned, but just generically content reuse and repurposing and just all the different things you can do with it. Um, I, I think, think that goes again, if you're talking about it like from an SEO perspective, that's how I kind of look at structure too now is that it's one of the structured content that you need to serve up like those JSON LD or whatever, however you're sharing the semantic information about your web page. that's part of what I'm doing. And that's all semantic which is all needs to be taxonomically organized and, and ontologically classified, you know, to, to help uh, advance your SEO efforts. So, um, so that's, I, they're just, I, I, I'm, I'm struggling for reasons not to structure content these days. You know, I did, I, I want, I, I, I would almost, I guess that, that's what I would say. I would almost flip the question and ask somebody who just hand built web pages, not? like, why on earth are you, why on earth are you doing that? <laughs> Tell me, why wouldn't you at least like tease out what you're doing Try to even just the tiniest bit of structure is going to help you get ready for the future. Well, and this is the big transition, right? So this is the transition of this discussion, and it's and to mark to your question about LLM specifically, it's this is the foundation. One needs to know what Google's knowledge graph is and how it works. You need to know what ontologies are, what taxonomies are, in order to have a chance to do this in a way that's not just a one-off task, and so. When we're getting into, I would love to, for you to walk through how LLMs and generative AI is being used by kind of the intellectual class in this world. Because I mean, you go to a knowledge graph <laughs> conference, you got the you got the folks who are up here at schools, and their you know practical applications are you know not nearly their top priority. But then you've got the people in the pra pra practical applications. So from your take of you know, from a, the knowledge graph elite and then the knowledge graph kind of practical applications, what are the ways that large language models and generative AI is being thought about by those two groups? Then I'm gonna get into some examples, specific examples of using generative AI with LLMs like that, which you might have access to, whether you're using a Cohere, whether you're using a Llama, whether you're using a ChatGPT even um, to make your life outrageously simple <laughs> you know well, i think at this stage of the game i gotta say that like the keynotes and all the presentations at 
uh, the Knowledge VR Conference and, and a lot of other, I just came back from decoupled days last week and the same similar thing there. I think everybody's at a similar level. You know, I think a lot of a lot of people are, um, uh, you know, thinking more strategically about oh, you know, generative AI and LLMs and how it might fit in. But I think everybody is looking at like, and it all starts with like the obvious benefit of these LLMs and, and generative AI is like the mundane crap. You know, that's mm -hmm. almost always a, a thing. It can help with anywhere along the line. So I think everybody is looking at how uh, generative AI can help their workflows. Like everybody, like from Dan, Denny, um, I can't pronounce his last name, the Wikid Wikid Wikidata founder, and, mm -hmm. or I don't know if he's founder, but he's a director at Wikidata. That, if you watch just one talk from the Knowledge Graph conference, that one's available on YouTube. Um, really, really good talk. But he, he and everybody there was talking about um, that, that sort of like, you know, that everybody's thinking about like, what can, what can these, these large language models and generative AI do to help me do my job better? And what can I offload right. to them so that I can focus on the cool, you know, more advanced stuff? Um, so I think that's that's the first thing I see. And then once you go that way, then we need to have, to have a four hour webinar <laughs> to talk about all the possible implications. It's crazy, like everything I've looked at the last six months, you can find a pretty profound implication of generative AI in um, how it, you know, how it might affect just any part of any workflow or any strategy. It's, it's, it, it's, it is as, you know, as, as much as it's kind of annoying to a lot of people like, oh, great, I got to change my whole life now. It's really profoundly affecting almost everything that I've looked at closely. Yeah, I think a key there, uh, it was something you mentioned and, and to some of the, the questions, and I got one on Twitter that's really good on this is that, uh, the use case, his big use case is he wants to make sure that things that are being written can be, um, and to uh, uh, mark your question here as we get into, these are the use cases. Um, being able to validate outputs of generative models, um, are they syntactically correct, but they're semantically wrong, right? That's a big mm -hmm. use case. That's where the puck's going. There's a lot of ways that you can validate outputs of generative models with this data set, this structured data set. So is it syntactically correct, semantically wrong, critical use case here? Um, that's, that's one. So for data validation, um, being able to use context, um, so being able to uh, build a brief description of a database schema, um, being able to start with you know broad queries and refine them iteratively based on uh, you know based on those data sets and I mean you mentioned one of them but converting data from one format to another uh, can be something that is a lot easier when there's a base so um, those are critical but I don't I don't really want to get into interacting with code let's just say so there's a lot of code review documentation generation that's possible. Um, I really want to get into kind of using this as a baseline to craft content strategies. Um, and um, what are the ways that you would foresee that becoming the, you know, the standard? I would see there being an application for technical documentation, but I'd also see there being an application for kind of ideation for marketing teams. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, it just, like I said a minute ago, it's like, it affects every single point in this scale. So like you think about just like the content strategy starts for me anyway, with like, you know, user stories and research and articulating, you know, what the, the users need as well as in, you know, discovery, internal discovery to figure out, make sure everybody's on the same page about your business goals mm -hmm. and how you're going to achieve that. Those, just those two things are not a given in any, never have been a given in any content strategy practice. And those are the kinds of things that generative AI, you know, can help with, you know, for example, running, like running your Slack instance through an LL, you know, feeding an LLM, your Slack, stuff and, and discerning things from there. I've, I have not done that myself, but I've heard of people doing that kind of thing. Um, so I, everything from that, like that internal discovery and then external discovery, there's a lot of discussion and consternation, to be honest, among UX researchers right now about using like uh, generative AI agents to um, do interviews and stuff. Uh, there's sort of, I think that's one of those places where you pretty quickly hit the edge case of the utility of it. It's like, well, you know, that's, kind of conversational, kind of human, but it's not really getting the same, eliciting the same discoveries that an actual human interviewer would. So right at that very top level, and then you get into things like content auditing. I haven't even 
I haven't even gone down this rabbit hole very far at all, but it's not hard at all to imagine when you think about the capabilities of generative AI to um, to just everything the you know the kind of the quantitative assembly of a content inventory and then the yep. qualitative evaluation it's like at every every i'm i'm picturing that giant spreadsheet we've all worked with that you grab your ga stuff and your screaming frog at audit and you put it all in a place and and every one of those cells there's something you can do with generative ai so um so i think it is so in terms of like content strategy it's like um it, you know, again, the answer is like, what is it not affecting? It's like there's there's implications for it everywhere, and I think that's going to be our job as practitioners going forward. Is like if you are a content strategist to figure out, you know, where the best benefits are and where you where it is worth spending your time and where you're just wasting time. And to be honest, I'm not sure that we're. I don't know how close we are to that. Um, a lot of you still see a lot of people. Like this is I may buckle and learn Python because that's you know uh, I've just seen too many demos like. John Maida and, and several folks at the decoupled days and at the Knowledge Graph conference doing demos of um, you know uh, fine tuning uh, prompts and stuff and it's like yeah that's really powerful stuff and but I think we all need to it's going to be I think there'll be no code low code ways yeah. of doing that you know but we'll we'll all need to get better at that so I it's I yeah. think it's kind of early days to say anything definitive about it yeah I think you've gotten into it though I mean and, and for those of people who use Market Muse every day the implementation of what you described is our inventory product and it is basically oh. doing it's doing what you described uh, and so you have all of your pages and topics it's literally called the inventory product so it's kind of fun to hear you describe it that way um, and I think that the use cases that we're seeing so imagine you have all of these things and you have this inventory where you've audited every page or page topic combination um, and two explicit use cases on these if you have a ontology or if you do not processing that entire inventory and distilling it or summarizing it llms do a great job of summarizing it um and there's uh, brian piper uh good good friend of the uh good friend of market news in the show is how do you use data to help you define and build your content pillars when you're first getting started um with a reorganization of your site i'll answer that question kind of twofold one would be if you're reorganizing it, you want to understand where you have strengths, where you have coverage, how much content you have. And then you would also love to have, if it exists, a third party taxonomy or structure of this concept. And so Wikidata is a great source of that. So great use case and something I've done with and chat GPT explicitly um, is uploading um, data structures, uploading, uh, knowledge graph data structures and having them be part of my process. So look at my site, look at this taxonomy, tell me what you can tell me. I'll even explicitly give custom instructions to ChatGPT, for example, to say, what of this taxonomy do I not have coverage on, right? And we can start to get into a real um, content strategist in the loop feel. It's not yet going to analyze it uh you know predictively but it is these are things that you can do today with 20 a month software which blows me away i mean it still blows me away that i can throw in a um an owl structure and i can throw in a uh you know a taxonomy i can throw in references to wikidata or wikipedia um and get very informed like at maybe a uh, a third year information architect was giving me in a third year in in, in professional Give, or, or maybe a junior in college is giving me advice. Um, and and that, that I think is something that's really new. Um, so I think use cases specifically is try to find relevant um, data structures, try to find relevant taxonomies, uh, try to find, um, you know, even if you're familiar with, you know, Sparkle queries, if you're familiar with OWL, if you're familiar with taxonomies, um, or even looking at, you know, collections of, of uh, free base IDs and the way that they work, um, which is a big piece of or a big piece of um, uh, Google's knowledge graph. So how do I learn from the good knowledge graph? Um, how do I learn from that in order to coach me on where I might have gaps? Um, and that's you know we try to bring that to the masses with our inventory software and our our um, knowledge graph technology. But I think if you're really into and you want to build it yourself, that will go there. So what are some things you've done with Google's knowledge graph um, 
And what can you tell us a little bit more about that and the way that it's you, you think about it, you use it that could be applied here? See, this is where it gets real good. Be, <laughs> no, to be honest, what's funny about that, like I got out of SEO like 15 years ago. Right. <laughs> so I haven't been that as focused on on, on Google's knowledge graph. Um, the, the main thing I got out of the, you know, of the fact that they created and coined the term the knowledge graph and, right. and articulated this concept of things, not strings, of concepts and objects rather than just simple words that describe things. Um, so that's the, you know, and and I haven't, and like I said, I think I said it earlier that like a lot of things I do in terms of structuring content, I'm always thinking about one of the end uses. Cause the way I think about it more now is like, I'm kind of an omnichannel service designer really is what I, is my actual kind of, it's actually my job title. I could I work with uh, Nazir Bina at Urbina Consulting now, and that's my job title there. Um, and uh, because, you know, so you're looking at like all the possible channels you can put this content into, and then what do you need on the back end? And how will you have the metadata and the structure in the middle that permits the assembly of that stuff from one side to the other, you know, to work? And so th that's the main way I've thought about it is one of the many use channel specific use cases is like, okay, on this web page, we're gonna need this metadata to, to re reassure Google that we know what we're talking about and and this is actually what the page is about. And, you know, and thinking, and that's also, that's a one of the, not side benefit, or the core benefit of structured content is that integrity that Google expects of between, you know, the structured data that you're providing um, in JSON-LD or XML, RDF, XML or whatever, that there's integrity between that and the content that's actually on the page. That's a lot easier to do when you have, the, that, that's part of your structured content strategy. Um, so that's the main way I've thought about it. I, like I said, I haven't done SEO proper in so long. Um, the, the more thing that I have but done- what you just like said, around, but just, just to, yeah. to what you just said though, and I'll, I'll step yeah. in is, what you just said is directly yeah. applicable to anyone who's ever done SEO. It's so important what you just said that you have basically the general knowledge, you have the content structures, you have items that would go into, for example, building a uh, building a, an effective chat bot, right? Building an effective strategy for, hey, these are the seven or eight pillars of our site, right? You. What are what is your source material? Is your source material structured well, or is it not? Right. That, those are the questions. And to Brian, to your question, it's to say, are you going to base that only on your site today, to think of what you want it to be tomorrow, or are you going to use other data sets? The more structured those other data sets are, the easier they're going to be to ideate on your ideal structure. And that's the key. I mean, and and so using generative AI to help you along. With those things, you miss much. Few, you will miss much fewer kind of branches of the tree, uh, or data mm -hmm. associations, and that's really where. That's where IAs that I know that are working on working with LLMs are trying to feed in, you know, multiple external sources along with their website or along with their site map, uh, or even like their own taxonomies to say, hey, am I comprehensive here? Um, and that's where there's immediate benefit. You can hop you can hop from, and I'll use a great example for this. I was just doing something for a legal firm um, and they were uh, a practice area uh, where they were missing complete practice areas because they were only thinking about it from this from the lens of um, you know what their words, their la their language, the way that they classify them. Um, and so, it brought up some ways. It wasn't just by looking at competitive cohort, which is a process. You can look at a competitor. How are they doing it? Compare. It was looking at kind of institutional knowledge about these things in addition to comp competition. So the long answer, short answer to what you just said is it's immediately <laughs> actionable. The three steps, explicit use case, competitive cohorts, you can use as competitive examples, any source of structured data plus your site today. Combine those three things together and toss it into, you know, effectively written prompts, and you've got an IA in the loop. So if you want to go, if you want to go to Brian, and I know Brian loves actionable examples, uh, is that is a dream scenario. And the fact that that can be done today with only a little bit of coding knowledge is truly remarkable. Um, so I, I love the way you described it. It's just key. You're, you are like, telling the story of how to do it. 
and it's like wow that you know to me it's like that that is intuitive because of the work that you've done is is striking so yeah you know one of the things i want to say about this too is that the you know this we're, we're mostly on the content side of the equation here mm -hmm. the other bunch of data that we have out there that we should have is like whatever's in your crm and your cdp or whatever you know about your customers right. because I, the way i think about this now is that, again as a service designer i'm i'm the content person you know, i'm a content person I'm, and and the way i think about like things like personalization or, or any of these things you have like a content purpose over here and a user need intent desire over here and you want these things to match up. And so I think, and I, this is another, like the way you, the examples you just gave show the, one of the many main benefits of these, um, of uh, these mod, these generative AI, well, the li large language models that they can help you dot your I's, cross your T's, do your due diligence, We've got all my bases covered here. The other side of that equation is like, what, which user needs am I not doing? And that's all taxonomically categorizable. And, you know, there's all kinds of ways to do that. So I think um, a challenge going forward, and this is something that I'm just big on is I'm calling it the orchestration layer. Like, how are you going to get, like, first of all, how are you going to orchestrate all your content coming from multiple places? Because in the worlds I operate in, a lot of this is being multiply sourced from many different places. And then also you're doing it on the channel delivery. You have all these channels you're delivering into. People will have slightly different needs in each of those. Your, your customers are going to have generic needs, stories that they're trying to, to finish and, and do, jobs that they're trying to do. Um, but um, anyhow, that, that, that's sort of like the, what you just described, those three kind of checklist items of like, um, you know, that I think that could be a little longer list. Yeah, and and it's, it's kind <laughs> yeah. of like annoying, you know, it's like, oh, great, you're giving me more work. But I really do feel like um, that one, it's something that has been known for a while. Like part of the reason I got out of SEO and, and, and began focusing on UX is that Google was ostensibly back then, even 15 years ago, talking about user intent and, you know, watching for pogo sticking and all that kind of behavior. And I was like, oh, yeah, I really am more of a UX designer than a marketer. So I'm going to I'm going to migrate that way. Um but I, anyhow, I, I, I still, um, I feel like, and one of the things that always drew me to SEO was this utter customer centricity. Like you got to, if you're not inside your customer's head, forget it. Why are you even trying? You know, and so again, that kind of comes back full circle to where I'm at now in, in um, service design and, um, you know, just being relentlessly customer focused. So I think figuring out, and I don't know, this is, I, I, I go back and forth on this as a content person, like, it's really my job to ascribe the purpose and intent, you know, the content that I'm doing and to do my best to match it up with channel needs. But um, I, we're getting to the point where like no one person can know or do everything. So I'm starting to feel the limits of it, but I do think we have to think about that stuff. No, I, I think you've, you've hit it. It's that um, what, what this, what this brings you is the ability to think differently about the way that things are connected to one another and what, it brings you is the ability to then create content that exhibits expertise more simply, right? And so, I mean, pets are always a great example, right? I mean, your brain naturally will only typically have one classification for one thing. It would just, your, your natural thing. And expanding your horizons to have all the relationships so, um, you know, another example, you can tell I've had talks about people doing this with pets and, and animals, so I'm so glad you set it up. But another example is, and then I'll get to Megan, great question you had. Um, she said she liked the freshwater saltwater analogy, is to say, if I said, okay, well, build me a taxonomy of dogs. Okay, you will, if you just give, if you give people that aren't taxonomists or aren't content marketers or aren't IAs, give them all that task. They're gonna classify those animals into different groups. Right. And they might say, OK, well, let's go with small breeds, large breeds, uh, aggressive breeds, non-aggressive breeds. I hate that, by the way. Um, uh, what, what about other things like country of origin? You might not have naturally thought of that relationship. You might not have. Maybe there's a relationship. Actually, what letter do they start with? Right. So you start to think differently. Hey, guess what? There's a lot of ways to parse this that all make logical sense for someone who's an expert. Um, and so that's something that I really, really want to stress is such a skill for SEOs and it's a way, and for content strategists, it's a way for you to understand or get to the point where you realize what's actually happening with generative AI and why knowledge graphs are part of this, 
right? Um, I'll give you a great example, Palm uh, or, or some of these like medical knowledge graphs are behind the scenes. Healthcare knowledge graphs are behind the scenes along with a database. Um, so it's the fact that these knowledge graphs exist and they're gonna be used to help your responses means you can have a step up if you understand how these knowledge graphs work and it's, it's, it's really critical. Um, so those are just some thoughts. I'll, I'll give you a good answer. A qu question from Megan, um, and hello, Megan. Uh, she, be, she feels like her content is much more LLM ready. I love that phrase. Let's get it. We don't want to get into what you what you might mean by that. Um, and is there a way to assess content structure against a standard like DITA? Um, that's a great question. What are your thoughts on that? Is this uh, is that something that's out of the box, or is there a um, do you know a use case for that? You know, I don't. It's like I think about this a lot because one of the things I like about DITA, I've never, I've never done a DITA implementation. I have a lot of friends in that world, and uh, you know, I've talked to you know people like Scott Abel, and I work with Nazar Bina now, who is like. He was working with some of the guys who wrote the data standard like 25 mm -hmm. years ago or something like that. you know so so i've been around that world but never but the thing i love about it is that it's so precisely structured and it has semantics built into it i think that's probably what megan's getting at there mm -hmm. um but um that I, but in terms of like a standard around that like i think you know the closest thing we have would be dita you know which is a w3c standard and uh like scos or scos however you pronounce it the 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 um the vocabulary um system the the taxonomical system in there which kind of to what you were just talking about a minute ago like you can talk about pets in any number of ways there's sort of like you know transitive genetic Linnaean relationships up and down, you know, a tree. But then there's also like hunting dogs, black dogs, species, yeah. white dogs, species. Yeah, there's all kinds of different ways you can slice and dice it. And SCOS gives you a way to do that. So in terms of like, but the combination of something like SCOS and DITA, you know, may give you the the capability for that kind of thing. But then it would be in the implementation of it. I don't know. I haven't done enough with either to know exactly how that might work. But I know that in terms of standards, those are two things. Like, and when it comes to standards, what that old XKDC cartoon where they go, it starts with like, well, we have 15 standards. We need one standard to rule them all. And the last pane is like, well, now we have 16 standards. You know, I'm like, just use what's there. That, that's sort of my first instinct that anything that any questions about standards. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, um, to uh, to your comment, uh, Megan, the uh, absolutely, it can be used through training and there will be people building software to do explicitly what you're asking. Um, I am not the person who's going to be building that software, um, unfortunately, unfortunately, um, but a the even the publicly available or commercially available un tuned models understand data and they understand it out of the box um, they can break down X, it can break, break down xml expertly um, and so and it can build relationship tables and it understands the relationships between task concept topics task topic reference topics immediately with no training it's chilling when you see it it's chilling because it can actually distill it and I can do something wild. Um, Chris Penn actually used this example, um, with, used a similar example in his presentation at Macon, but he said basically one magical thing, and this is kind of one of my things I wanted to catch, catch up with you on after this, but is one magical thing is the thing Larry said earlier about can we make this easy, right? I actually think the answer to this question is yes, and LLMs will be the thing that lets us make this easy, easier for people to get. Because Chris Penn, is, who is amazing, if you don't know Chris Penn, uh, Trust Insights, um, is you can, if someone is very familiar about pets, if somebody loves golf, if somebody likes hockey, you can ask, you can take a large language model and you can ask them to build analogies for you. For someone who loves who knows a lot about cooking, try to associate data to cooking, right? And so you can make things easy to understand, but the framework of it is even out of the box, these technologies understand these frameworks. So you can actually into a code interpreter, you can upload an OWL file, you can upload XML and it will be naturally inherently understood. Okay. And that is the superpower, right? That's the superpower. What are you going to do with that? 
becomes your, you know, your your dream. And in my case, when I'm taking a, you know, a the stand, you, there, I think there's one. It's a database, standard Stanford database of dog breeds. I'm pretty sure that's a thing. You can, it might, I might be wrong, but take a, a taxonomy and get that into the system, right? Now I start defining the outputs that I want, right? And I start defining the analysis that I want through, you know, um, whether I have to build something custom or refine it. That's when you start getting dangerous. And to your question, um, uh, Megan re responded, yes, it can transform a concept topic to a task topic with accurate tagging very well. I would love to see Market Muse associate the data structure to what is great SEO. That's a great point. That's something we are going to do. And those are the types of things that, that we are going to do. So that's a great question. Um, so Larry, to what I was saying is, what are the ways that you would like to see people to think about transforming code into easy to understand? Or what, what are the ways that you think that that could be taken and run with? Well, I think just generically, this example is a perfect example of like, you know, computer programs that are hard for humans and would take us, you know, several months to learn, they, these LL agents like chat GPT just know it out of the box. And, and so you can start offloading anything. Like when I think about like way back in the day, I used to do, this is like 30 years ago, I was doing like BI kind of stuff when, and was learning. Um, I, I actually ended up learning SQL queries cause I broke, I couldn't, I got past what the, um, the machines could help me with. I think we're, we're going to be struggling to keep up. We're not going to be able to do what I did back then, which is like to get beyond the capabilities of the, the crummy BI software at the time and have to learn SQL. Um, we're just going to be struggling to ke keep up with how much these things know about trivial stuff. Like they still don't know stuff. They don't have, they're, they're just probabilistic models. And it's mm -hmm. a lot easier, a lot easier to predict the probability of something happening when it's, structured in a, in a language that it understands than like human language. It's getting really good at understanding and predicting human uh, speech, but it's still, um, it, it's more of a slam dunk for the, for the, for the, um, the programming based stuff. So I think again, just um, this is where I, I feel like my, my life decisions have been justified, <laughs> you know, that like <laughs> getting on top of this stuff, you know, conceptually is equally as if not more important as understanding the technical details of like how to write, Python or JSON, um, LD, or you know whatever, whatever you're trying to do, like understanding what's going on under the hood, and letting, uh, you know, uh, that's why we built computers just to do that kind of stuff. We don't humans don't, you know, we we have the brains that are capable of, but we've got better things to do. Right, right, right. Um, amazing. I, you know, I think that where what what is happening right now is we're at. Uh, Paul Reitzer said, this is, the, it might have been him or Mike, uh, Kapo, he said, this is the worst version of AI you'll ever use, is what we're dealing with today, right? Um, and, you know, everything we do, everything we do as, you know, whether we're running businesses, consultancies, or running, you know, technical communications groups, or, or whatever, whatever we do, um, we, we're doing things that no one has ever done before. And so when I'm watching, no one's ever done this before, what we're talking about, right? Um, what, we're, what, what I'm seeing is people really thinking creatively about tying together knowledge graphs, uh, tying together knowledge graphs to you know, language models. Um, what, is, uh, uh, what is a way that we can use a open AI chat GPT, open AI GPT, TX model to convert unstructured text data into structured knowledge graph representation. You know, these are all things that are going to happen in 2023. And so it's your job to be ready for it. Whomever it is, you have to be ready for what can happen here because you could lose two, three years if you don't. And that's where I think that the really the thought process, how can unstructured data become structured data? How can someone whose job is to build these things, um, you know, how can you get ahead of the game there? Um, and that's where I, you know, that's what I'm thinking about all the time is how can I generate taxonomies automatically, <laughs> right? Um, how can I take a collection of prompts and automatically build knowledge graph representation? How can I use embeddings? Um, and that's really where I think of this what, what are the things that you think are going to come in 2023 that you're most excited about or worried about well i think um 
I, I don't, it's, I'm too busy to worry. That's the beauty of this. Is it's like, they're like distracting us so much. With it. uh, it's like I'm just struggling to keep up. But um, well, one of the things that, as you were talking, I was realizing one of the things that it's only the last few months have I really got it in, you know, in my head, like the, the, the true nature of an LLM. They're just a probabilistic, and they're only one of dozens of kinds of, active, of artificial intelligence out there. So I think that's right. one of the things I'm looking forward to is like, the combination of these kind of neural net based things and knowledge representation models in particular, because the neural net, th you know, like the LLMs, they're, they're really good probability, you know, they're really good prediction things. But as um, like Tim Neat Gebru and um, Emily Bender called it in that famous paper, they're just stochastic parrots. They're just like, you know, repeating, you know, or I, th I think of them as mansplainers. They're just like, hey, I heard a bunch of stuff on the internet and I can predict what the next thing that somebody might say about that would be. That's kind of how they work. Whereas the knowledge representation models, like an ontology driven knowledge graph, you know, there's that's an actual knowledge or representation model that you can do something with. In both cases, you can vectorize. You know, with the word embeddings that you find there, you can, you know, you find the same words. Just the 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 the, the LLMs are just predicting based on those vector proximities of things to one another. Whereas a, a, a you know a knowledge graph is like, no, I know what's going on here, and I can tell you how those things are related. And and the real power of knowledge graphs is the ability to infer new and different things that you might never have come up with. I think that's, we're glimpsing some of that with LLMs. It's like predicting stuff that you might not have thought of. But I think with knowledge graphs and knowledge representation models, we'll get to where, holy crap, like genuine insights that a human being might have come up with, but that'll be accelerated too. So I think that's what, I guess, and then that's just one example, just those, you know, the knowledge graphs and LLMs uh, somehow combining forces. And I, so I, that's, that's a, I think a, a, a safe prediction is that we'll see more like mixing and matching and mashups of various kinds. The other thing is like, I'm just really curious if there's another thing out there, <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. LLMs appeared to come out of nowhere and just take over, take all the oxygen out of the room. Is there another thing? Cause I, and, and I know tons of folks who've been doing that stuff for years and we're just like, well, yeah, I, you know, they just advance things a little bit and, you know, not a little bit, a lot, obviously, but I wonder, I'm, I'm kind of staying poised for like, okay, what's the next thing that we need to pay attention to? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I never do a screen share, but I think it's, I think it's necessary right now. And um, my team's like, Oh gosh, is he really going to do a screen share uh, during a webinar? Uh, but I am going <laughs> to just uh, show you some things that are possible. Um, let's see if this is going to work here. Uh, and we will give this a give this a, a, a shot here. Okay, so this is possible today. Can you see my screen, Larry? I can't. Oh, there it is. Yep, I'm seeing it now. All right, so I can cross-reference the Google. Now, this isn't my code. This is somebody else's code. But I can cross-reference Google's knowledge graph to build taxonomies right now. I can do this with entire sites. I can do this with entire organizational. But this prompt is Boston. I have some other stuff over here, but I'm, I'm not showing you all of it. But this prompt is Boston Terrier type of dog breeds breed of. So all of these things are possible. You can take words and immediately visualize, uh, immediately visualize their structures and the hierarchy today by tying together OpenAI's API and frameworks like Google. So you can do this today. So you got to start thinking about the why. And that's what I'm going to leave this group on is what's the why for you to know the structure of data? What's the why for your content strategy to actually know the way that relationships happen? Um, and I think that's where I'm so excited about is that being able to tokenize data, being able to associate it um, is going to be the way that we take maybe a page of text and turn it into a knowledge graph is that something that you can see happening right now it's it, you know it, it, people have tried that and done that like um and that's where i think like the folks at the knowledge graph conference were excited about the opportunity to to evaluate a corpus do some word embeddings extract it run it against whatever you know and then and then going the next step and building something you didn't know before um <sighs> And I think, and in that case, that's going to be one of those, because the, the, the clear message across all of these applications of generative AI is the need for human eyeballs on the end product. And so 
just as like, you know, ontologies are typically designed, you know, bottom up from all the data instances and top down from like kind of your intent and how you, uh, you know, how you perceive the domain you're in, there'll be some similar, you know, as those things come together, there's going to be need for, you know, that especially the top down look at that, you're going to need mm -hmm. to have um, human eyeballs going like, yeah, that, that makes sense. Because there's a lot of stuff that that kind of looks like it might make sense, but if, on closer inspection, it doesn't. So, um, wow. you know, it's sometimes called human in the loop, but uh, I know some people are getting tired of that term already. And they were, they're talking about, <laughs> I use well, it all the humans, time. We're running things. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. And I do too. But a lot of, a lot of, a lot of friends that I'm in this personal knowledge graph working group. And a lot of my friends there talk about like, no, this is a human thing. We're just going to keep computers in the loop. We'll, we'll keep apprised of what we're up to. This is all in service to humans. I think it's kind of it's a it's a delightfully can, uh, cantankerous view of things, <laughs> but I, I still say human in the loop. Yeah. No, I love it. I, I think it's it's a way to do things that are really special. Um, I am experimenting with this stuff right now, and I think if anyone's if if you made it to the tail end of this and we're about to wrap up, it's um, how can you associate this and learn about the text you write um, more specifically, and really really get. What your, you can distill, for example, your uh, narrative into pieces and distill it into the why and the how. Um, and it's something that I'm actively working on. It's something that very few people are, um, but I can now see content like it's through an x-ray vision, an x-ray vision of the knowledge graph. And being able to do that fast is a superhuman power. And I think that, you know, the knowledge that I've gleaned from Larry over the years, and then also, you know, just thinking today, it's about what did you not know about this page that you could know about this page? And what did you not know about this topic that you could know about this topic? That's the question I'll leave everybody with. And uh, if you want to get an audit, a comprehensive audit and an inventory and get that inventory out of your spreadsheet, please uh, uh, give me a, a, a buzz at jeff at marketmuse.com or marketmuse.com slash book demo. Uh, we have a code for Content Marketing World, if you're going to be there, $100 off SP100. Um, and thank you for joining us. We got a little bit long, but Larry, what's next? What do you got going on, uh, travel, ev ev events, or uh, just what are you working on? I got no time to think about what's next. I've, I'm just starting a big project, um, and I just moved to the Netherlands, So, and I've still got like some details to tidy up there. So I'm just settling into a new home. Uh, starting a big new um, content modeling project for a big, um, pretty prominent nonprofit in the U.S., and then um, you know, looking for something uh, hopefully more closely tied to knowledge graphs and modeling in the new year. So, which is still a ways off. But, yeah. Hey, if you all send me a note at Jeff at marketmuse.com, I will also send you some examples of me uh, making videos of analyzing text and turning it into entity relationship diagrams. <laughs> and knowledge graphs and all that fun stuff. Um, and uh, I'd love to talk with anybody about that if they are also innovating in the space. I know a few people who have DM'd me on the Twitter X are people who are doing that. So I'm glad that we brought that to the loop. That's why I showed the screenshot. Um, so we've had, I've had 16 people, uh, oddly enough, DM me on the X saying they're working on that right now. So um, that's very validating uh, because that is where SEO is going is the people that are thinking about relationships and thinking about taxonomies are trying to figure out how to weave that into their content strategy. And I think it's going to come from people like you getting back in the SEO world. Uh, it's going to happen. So thanks, Larry, for joining us. It's been such a pleasure. And uh, I think, um, you know, this year that these are the types of events that are probably going to become boring next year because there's going to be a webinar about this every week. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for all your help, Larry. And uh, I am very envious that you're in the Netherlands um, and hope to see you real soon. Likewise. Um, oh, and, and, you know, just to note that, that it's, over, it's, what, eight or nine months away, but there's already buzz building about the Knowledge Graph Conference next year. So get it in your calendar. So Beautiful, beautiful, yeah. beautiful. And Liz, you have an email coming with that video. And uh, Larry, I'll send it to you too. Uh, there's some cool stuff uh, out there that you can do just with off the shelf APIs. So uh, it's, it's a pleasure. All right, talk to you soon. Fun. Thanks so much.